I worry very much about those kinds of chemicals because even if we said today, we're done, we're banning these, we're never gonna make them again, we're never gonna be exposed to them again, they're already in our bodies and they're in the environment and we're gonna continue to find them in our bodies and we can continue to expect that they can cause harm. My name is Laura Vandenberg. I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental Health Sciences at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. My PhD is in Cell, Molecular, and Developmental Biology. We think about very particular times in life as windows of susceptibility or windows of vulnerability. Those are times in life where hormones would normally be making decisions, helping tissues to make decisions or cells to make decisions. That means that if you are exposed to an endocrine disruptor that mimics a hormone or one that blocks hormones during that period of time, there's no do-over. You can't go back. And you know, there's this great quote from the late Theo Colborn who studied endocrine disruptors and she said, you can't go back and rewire the brain. So if you get it wrong, it's wrong. You, there's no fixing that. Endocrine disruptors are chemicals that can mimic hormones or block hormones or alter how our bodies use hormones. And that might not sound like a big deal if you don't understand what hormones do, but they do a lot more than just the fun stuff, right? So I teach college students, they think about hormones in terms of sex, which is the fun stuff. But hormones are responsible for really organizing every organ of our body from conception until death. They have the job of telling cells what to become and how to become those tissues, those organs. We need hormones to maintain our body temperature, to maintain our blood pressure, to be able to digest uh, and use food. We need them, of course, for reproduction. Uh, they also affect the aging process and our immune systems and our brain development. So they're really, really important and fiddling them by exposing ourselves or our children to endocrine disruptors means that we're fiddling with the most important processes of life. If hormones do all of these important jobs, disrupting those hormones means that you're going to disrupt all of those important jobs. Brain development, the digestion of food so that you can access glucose, sugar in your body, the development of the reproductive organs, the ability to get pregnant, the ability to stay pregnant, the ability to nurse your babies, the aging process, the ability to fight off infections. All of these things are controlled by the endocrine system. And you expose a person or an animal to an endocrine disruptor, you start to fiddle with those processes. That can lead to real diseases, things like diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, changes in organs that could predispose you to cancer, predispose you to immune problems. It can change the way that the brain develops. So you'll end up with changes in your IQ, changes in behavior, changes in your ability to control your behavior, like anxiety or ADHD. All of those things, you can fiddle with them and you're gonna end up with a problem. Endocrine disruptors are found in soil, which means they're also found in food. They're found in food packaging. They're absolutely found in the air that we breathe. They're found in the water that we drink, that we wash ourselves in. Environment really should be defined not just by those things that we think of as science-y, those matrices, but also everything we interact with, all of the consumer products. For the fetus, the environment is mom's body. So everything she puts on her body or in her body is part of the fetal environment. That's what I worry about. One of the major problems, I think, with the chemical industry is this revolving door between people who work for industry who leave and go to work for the regulated groups that are supposed to oversee that industry and back and forth and back and forth. There's golden parachutes, right? There's the promise of go work at that uh, regulatory agency and when you're done and want to make a whole bunch of money, we'll make sure there's a job for you. So if you do that, are you going to hold them accountable when you're in the position to hold them accountable? No. And we've seen that over and over and over again. Big Tobacco had a series of tactics that they used, including things like hiring experts who had no real expertise to say that smoking wouldn't hurt you. The targeted advertising, production of their own scientific studies that they had warped and manipulated the data, cherry picking data, all these kinds of tactics. Now we see other industries are using the same tactics. The tobacco industry literally wrote a playbook. 
and we've seen it reused over and over, including by industries that make endocrine disruptors, plastics industries, personal care product industries, the pesticide industries, as well as big coal, climate science. It's used over and over because it's effective. Industries have a lot of interest in manufacturing doubt. If they can make you think, ah, but I really like using this product and they don't know for sure that it's bad for me, they're gonna keep using it. And so they continue to make money. The longer that they can delay regulatory action, the longer they make money. There's this very famous document that was released by the tobacco industry during one of the lawsuits against them where an industry executive said, doubt is our product. Not cigarettes, not tobacco, doubt is our product because it is the means of creating a controversy in the minds of the public. Do most people know that the plastic that they're using is made from oil that came out of the ground? No, that's, that's just a hidden thing. They produce their own data that suggests that this is totally safe and they fight data that come from people like me to say, no, those, those people, they don't know what they're talking about. So the playbook continues to be used over and over. Recycling. Plastic recycling is also part of that whole playbook, right? This idea that we're creating products, but they won't have a footprint on the earth because plastic is recyclable. And this realization of what a lie plastic recycling is. First of all, most of it is not recycled. And second of all, a lot of it can't possibly be recycled with modern technology because it's not just about what the building block of that chemical, that, that plastic product is, but everything that got added to it to change its color, to make it UV safe, to make, right? We change plastics in so many ways that each one is its own mixture. A colleague once said, recycling is the fig leaf of plastic production, right? It just barely covers the subject and that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to make us feel good, when in fact it's a big lie. Hormones in our bodies have effects at part per trillion concentrations. That's like a drop of water in an Olympic sized swimming pool. Endocrine disruptors have effects at that same low concentration, part per trillion concentrations. So we can't just say, oh, it's okay. We're only exposed to a little bit. Some people end up with a male body plan. Male body parts comes from parts per trillion exposures testosterone and other male hormones during fetal development. It's that tiny amount that makes you male. But you gotta be exposed at the right time. You're making it in your own body, which means even low levels of endocrine disruptors that alter those hormones alter what it means to be male. And we don't take that risk when we're talking about drugs. So why would we take that risk when we're talking about environmental chemicals? But there are plenty of chemicals that I've studied in my lab, and I, I've studied probably about a dozen chemicals in my lab. We find effects on brain development, behaviors, like anxiety behaviors, OCD-like behaviors, hyperactivity behaviors. We see effects on the way that moms interact with their pups, their babies, uh, with their ability to nurse. We see changes in the timing of puberty, in the development and in disease of the mammary gland, and in the reproductive tract. Oh, and in the metabolic tissue. When we look, depending on the chemical, we find effects. And again, I choose chemicals because they're known to mimic or block hormones. So it's not a surprise that I see effects. We pick these chemicals because people are exposed to them and we're using them to try to probe our understanding of what they might be doing in people. Everyday products found in our houses that will never break down in the environment. If we think about what their half-life is, that's if I had a bucket of it, how much would it take till it broke down to only half of a bucket? It's measured in geologic time, eons. Those chemicals will be here on Earth virtually unchanged when our species is extinct. I mean, isn't that very strange that some of us don't seem to think that it's a bad thing to leave the earth in a different state in which we found it. We should care about leaving the earth in the state in which we found it. On a fundamental you know, belief in the value of nature, that should matter to us. It should also matter because 
since those are chemicals that will never break down in the environment, means as long as people are on this earth, we will continue to be exposed to them. And those are chemicals that have effects at tiny, tiny amounts on brain development, on reproductive development, on immune function. They're serious, serious chemicals. We know from studies of chemicals that if I expose you and then I don't ever expose anyone again, I can see effects for some of these chemicals on your grandchildren who were never exposed, on great-grandchildren who were never exposed. Because these chemicals, they don't mutate your DNA, they change the way that the DNA gets turned on and turned off. And it can be done in a permanent way that gets passed on generation after generation after generation.